members of the audience, please do feel free to just ask any questions or um, flag me on anything that you'd like a little bit more clarification on. Uh, in particular, I believe this is mostly theory people, so I've tried to pitch it accordingly. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to um, find the, the, the read that the stuff I find is very interesting. So how many of you know what this image is? Okay. Oh, three people. Well, guess what? The rest of you will by the by midway through my talk. So that's something to look forward to. I think the most important information from this front slide, though, is that if you find any of this stuff interesting and want to learn more about it, we do have two websites, chock full of information, both sort of summary pages of the science that we've um, published now, really led by the students and the young postdocs in our um, team, and then also some fun animations and things like that that um, feel free to steal for your, for your own talks, because I know I've done that uh, for, from other um, teams. So, I always like to start my talks out with some um, questions, right, because that's what we do. We, we, we come here or come into our office or, you know, thinking about what it is that we really want to try to tackle. And it's not, oh, I'm going to go get a lot of data or I'm going to run big simulations. The question is, are, you know, what's driving those efforts? And so, for me, it's really how do galaxies form. Now, that's a really big question. So that, that employs many hundreds of astronomers over many, many decades. So that's something that's a very big question, which I hopefully will be able to um, make some uh, contribution to. But then if I want to break that down, I say, well, actually what I really want to know is how do galaxies actually assemble their stars? And so if I want to think about that, then I want to think about when and where do stars actually form? Because we know from higher formation that you know, what ends up as the Milky Way didn't always, wasn't always just the Milky Way, it's many components. And so really trying to break this down into a historical record for our, not just one galaxy, but many, many galaxies and all through cosmic time is really what um, my team is, is focused on. In terms of the team, it's a very international collaboration. Uh, I think this is, these are most of the members of the team, um, but heavy uh, uh, representation by Australia, of course, and the U.S. And uh, just, just to get, you know, stress the team size, although it's not that large by comparison, probably certainly high energy teams. Um, I know it has grown significantly, which is great. In particular, it's grown with students. And so the people in green are the ones that um, I supervise directly, and pretty much all of them are students. And so the work that you'll be seeing today really is um, the work that's been done by them. And in terms of what ZForge and ZFire and Mosul, the um, projects that I'll be talking about today, those questions that we try to answer, we tackle um, by looking at these various areas stellar mass functions, star formation histories, family relations, uh, environment, and AGN. Now, obviously, I'm not going to talk about all of that today, because I only have 45 minutes. Um, but if you like any of these things, please do go to those websites that I, I popped up at the beginning of the talk. Why only in the 12 gigahertz? Um, because we really just try to only go up to around redshift of 7 or so. That's really our focus. Okay. And so, well, that, so that's like 13. Yeah, so yeah, 7, 7 and a half. On that, on that order. Uh, in terms of the, the surveys I'll be talking about today, I, I know that sometimes you get acronym overload and you're like, what does all of this mean? Uh, so th there are really three main surveys that I've been uh, managing. Um, and the first one is ZForge. Uh, I give this talk when I'm in the Europe or, the U or Australia, and I, they, everyone calls it Z. It really throws me off. So I, we pick the one letter in the alphabet that half the world always mispronounces wherever I am. So Z Forge or Z Forge is a near infrared imaging survey. It's um, run with Magellan, which of course people here are very familiar with. And the idea is you um, really capitalize on deep near infrared imaging, multiband imaging, and you look for really interesting objects. And from there, you can actually then go and do um, spectroscopic follow up because spectroscopy, of course, is very, very expensive really need large um, mirrors to collect enough photons to do something uh, with, with the light. So let's start with ZForge. Um, first, all of these are released. Images and catalogs go to this website. There's a fun, you can go and uh, it's like Google Maps except for our survey fields. And you can just click on objects and you can pull up stuff. So if you see something that's like really blue or green or red, you can click on it and it'll actually give up, give um, the, the what we call our bios for each of those objects. It's a lot of fun. You will waste many hours on this website. I hope you do anyway. Now, in terms of why you want to go near infrared, this is the deepest image, one of, actually, I 
give us the deepest optical image that has been taken um, of the sky, the teeny tiny force part of the sky. I draw these boxes here for um, help. They're not really there in space. Uh, but if, why do you want to use near infrared imaging? So as you can see, even with the deepest optical imaging, the universe is still fairly dark. Uh, but if you start adding a little bit of light at longer and longer wavelengths, you start seeing objects. So objects that were completely invisible, even in the deepest optical imaging, suddenly pop up clearly in the near infrared. And so he's just a com comparison from um, optical only to uh, optical with HST, by the way, to near and optical um, with near infrared imaging uh, from Magellan. And so what we do is with Z-Forge on um, Magellan, we, use, um, we split these bands, the broad bands, and we split them into medium bands. And so what we do is we split J and H into two medium bands. And then um, for comparison on the right-hand side, you see J and H, those are the broad bands. And so the little movie that you're seeing, which was done by my former student, Adam Tomczak, um, you can see the redshift corresponds to the SED. So as the SED gets pushed to higher and higher redshift, you can see how um, the photometry samples different parts of the SED. And so it's almost like it's going, this point is just going down the slide here. Right? And then because you're sampling it um, more finely, you're able to get photometric redshifts on the order of, with precision on the order of about 2% or so. Um, whereas even with HSC, as you get higher resolution and deeper imaging, but because those filters are much broader, you just don't know exactly where those um, features are falling, and so your uncertainty is about a factor of five times larger. Um, now, you're like, well, what's the big deal, 2% versus 10%? You know, if you had to go and walk to the nearest store to get some sugar, um, if you wanted to walk two miles, you're like, okay, I can do that, and then you find out it's actually 10, I think you'd be pretty annoyed, right? And so, in particular, you want to be able to have this high precision, especially if you want to be able to map structure um, through uh, a, a space at higher redshift. So that, that, for us, was a really um, big advantage. So just to give you a summary of what that looks like, here you have those filters, those uh, split J and split H. K-band is just broadband, although right now I'm, I won't talk about it, but we're in the process, not in the process, where I actually got a lot of data. We've now split the K-band, we're doing this on Gemini, um, and uh, to try to push things out to higher redshift. I won't talk about that at all, but you can ask me about that if you like. Uh, so here are the nominal depths that we have for these. These are all 80 magnitudes. Um, I know those are silly astronomer units, but let's just say it's really deep. Just trust me on that. Uh, so what do we do? Of course, we point at all the legacy fields that all the extragalactic people like to do. So these are candles field, candles fields, and so our footprints are is in green because four star um, looks like this. It's a square. Uh, so now we have great information, uh, big surveys, about 70,000 objects, what do we do? So what I like to do is try to understand, like I said, stars, where do stars form, how do the galaxies then assemble their stars? And how do we actually track star formation? Of course you have the optical, and optical is very good in the sense that you can get a lot of objects in one go with just a couple sets of filters. Um, but, and I'm not going to ask, so when I do a physics talk I ask people which one they think has uh, more star formation. And it's usually 50-50. I, I know you guys know, right? so I won't. But anyway, they uh, so you can get the optical, but you know that already in the optical you're limited because if, as soon as you have any dust, right, all those photons get pushed to the near infrared. And not only that, the optical is limited, especially as you go to higher redshift. So for that, of course, Spitzer, rest in peace. Did everybody know it took its last readings? Yeah. Okay. So Spitzer Space Telescope um, um, shut down a couple of weeks ago, it's very sad. Um, but it has made a huge impact on our field, because now all those photons that we missed in the optical um, were captured in the near infrared, and that really transformed our, our view of where star formation is happening, not just in the local universe, but all the way up to high redshift. Uh, I always love asking this other question, how big do you think Spitzer is? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? Yeah. I was going to say, you, unfair advantage. I'm just asking the younger people, maybe who weren't around when the telescope was being built. Any ideas? Do you think it's bigger or smaller than Hubble? 
Smaller. Smaller. Yeah, so it's about, it's about this big, right? So you want, it's, it's, big, it's just big enough to hug. And you kind of want to because it made such an impact on our field, right? So, you get, uh, so here you have the imaging from Switzerland. It's great. It also gives you, of course, a lot of bang for your buck because in a few filters, um, combining it with the optical, you can get tens of thousands of objects in one go. Um, but of course, that's also uh, limited in terms of information on kinematics. If you want to study more about individual galaxies, you have to go in and get spectra. Um, and so this is just a nice little uh, cartoon of one. It's just a nearby star forming spiral galaxy. And in particular, I just want to stress um, a, a couple of lines here, which we're going to talk about again in a bit. So those are, uh, as you probably tell, I like to have an interactive audience. Um, and anyone want to guess what those lines are? Oh, great, H -band. Yes, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these lines in particular are going to be really important for tagging galaxies at, high, uh, at the higher redshift. But just, you know, I think just to kind of give everybody a nice anchoring point as a reminder, these are quiescent galaxies. They have a very, you know, um, relatively flat SED, and then the same with star forming, and it's something now that you have all these nice spiky emission lines. Um, in terms of what these SEDs look like, this is just a stack of them. Uh, and so you can see as you go from um, young star forming galaxies, you have a lot of UV emission, of course, those are from the OB type stars, um, and then it pushes down, and then of course, as you go to um, uh, older and older populations, the SED kind of just shrinks on this side, and then of course there you're just tracing the stellar, stellar mass at, at larger, longer wavelengths. So it would be great if I could get this for every single object in my survey, 